Right, so good evening everyone and welcome to our combined events uh, by Take Charge and our Women with Heart group for February of 2019. So I hope everyone is aware that February is Women's Heart uh, Health Month. So it only makes sense if February is Women's Heart Health Month that our topic today is all going to be about women's heart health. Heart disease is the number one killer of women. Yet despite that, um, women are generally routinely under-researched, that's quite all right, under-diagnosed, under-treated, under-supported, and in many cases, women don't know a lot of the signs and symptoms about heart disease. So tonight, we're looking to change as much of that as we possibly can. We have two experts that we're going to hear from today. Our first speaker is going to be Dr. Ashley Heidema. Ashley is currently completing her Cardiovascular Rehabilitation and Prevention Fellowship right here in our cardiac rehab program. Uh, she completed her medical degree at the University of Toronto and then her internal medicine and cardiology training at the London Health Sciences Centre and Western University. Um, her research interests centre around cardiac rehab in special clinical populations and knowledge translation invo involving direct patient care and care delivery. Specifically, she's interested in working with heart failure patients and I know she helps me run my heart failure class on Thursday afternoons. We're very grateful that she's there with us. Um, and specifically with advanced heart failure therapies such as left ventricular assist devices. We had a session on Take Charge a little while ago talking about LVAD. So that's uh, Dr. Heidema's interest. Um, our other speaker is Dr. Laura Banks. Uh, Laura also used to work with me in the heart function class. So the Thursday class is well represented today. Uh, Dr. Banks is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Toronto Rehab. She completed her graduate and postgraduate training at the University of Toronto in the areas of heart function and exercise. Her current research focuses on how to optimize exercise training for patients with heart disease and type 2 diabetes, in particular with high intensity interval training, another topic that we've uh, discussed here as a little while. Okay. So that's going to be our topic for tonight. We're going to have two great speakers, and Dr. Heidem is going to start the session off. Actually, thank you. So thanks, everyone, for having me. Uh, you're going to have to excuse me, but I have a cold, and I've been coughing all day, so I'll do my best. So we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, being heart smart and how sex plays into that. Um, talk a bit about the issue, discuss where the problems exist, talk about awareness and change, and then talk about how cardiac rehab fits into that as well. So sex is a construct that, uh, and gender, so sex and gender have been something that's been a lot more uh, closely defined in the literature and a lot uh, more explored in the last couple of years. Um, so sex is defined by the CIHR, which is the Canadian Institute for Health Research, as a genetic construct. So it's what influences your genes and it's not something that's affected by the society or how people um, can perceive themselves and that is more of a gender issue. So we're going to focus kind of on sex today but just to keep in mind that it's important to think about how gender and society and lifestyle influence our choices especially because 80 percent of cardiovascular disease is prevented or is preventable. Society and lifestyle choices obviously have a big effect on that. Um, so globally, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of women, and about a third of women's deaths globally are due to ischemic heart disease and stroke. Uh, and the, the um, Heart and Stroke has just released a new report for 2019 saying that every five minutes a Canadian dies of heart disease, uh, cardiovascular disease, stroke, or vascular uh, related mind or brain problems. So it's a huge issue. Um, in Canada, heart disease is the leading cause of premature death for women. So this is women before their expected uh, life expectancy. And every 20, women, 20 minutes, sorry, a woman dies from heart disease. Uh, and this isn't talked about as much. So cardiovascular disease has been thought of historically as being a man's disease. Um, and it's interesting because we hear a lot about breast cancer being a female um, predominant disease, obviously. Um, but about five times as many women die from heart disease as breast cancer. Um, and this is not a new thing, that heart disease is, is an important problem for women. Um, and 
this is back in 2003 that this was a cover of Time magazine. So um, it tried to emphasize the point even then that we're really missing the mark when it comes to women in cardiovascular disease. And it's a three-pronged program or problem. Sorry, it's a problem that comes from the public perception. It's a problem that comes from healthcare providers, and it's a pro it's a public system problem as well. So it's not surprising that when we look at where money goes for research, so where money is raised and where people are dying, that the, they don't match up. So the cancer world has done a really good job about raising awareness and raising funds. And you can see the pink circle on the left, or on the right, sorry, um, shows you how much money is raised. And it, breast cancer actually has the most money raised for it uh, nationally. Uh, and the circle on the left shows you how many deaths are due to cardiovascular disease and you can see all the way down towards the middle there that small little circle about how much money is raised uh, for heart disease. So from a health perspective we're not doing a very good job about advertising to the public where the risks really lie or the cancer societies have just been doing a really good job about raising awareness and we can learn some lessons from them so I think it's probably a little bit of both. So. We do have more knowledge about cardiovascular disease in women and there's been national studies that have been done in the past couple of years. So 2017 there was a study done of, about Canadians and when they looked at the population of women 19 to 29, they found that only 30% of women believe that heart disease can be different for men and women. This was slightly better when you got into the over 50 population but we're still talking around 60%. About 40% of women 19 to 29 eat unhealthy food five times per week or more, and about 58% report stress most or every day. And these are all risk factors we know that can de uh, de determine how your cardiovascular risks happen later on in life. And the more uh, incidence of heart disease has really been in the population of women under 50, and that has been skyrocketing. It's the only group uh, of, uh, the only age group where cardiovascular deaths have actually been increasing, and it's very different in men. So the deaths have actually been decreasing in all age populations in men. The deaths have been decreasing in women, except for when you look at this younger population. So we really need to start speaking to our younger women about what they can do now to prevent having cardiovascular disease and problems in the future. In a Canadian survey from 2013, when we're talking about risk factors, less than 50% of women identified smoking as a risk factor, and less than a quarter were able to name the other leading cardiovascular risk factors. So it's not just uh, lifestyle issues, it's also education that we're just not getting to our um, young women. So I know most of you probably know our traditional cardiac risk factors. Does anyone want to yell some of them out for us, for me? Okay, so can anyone throw out any cardiovascular risk factors for me? Inactivity. Yep, so inactivity. Um, okay, so inactivity, so just yell some other ones out for me. Smoking. Smoking, absolutely. Age is another one. If you have a family history, um, diabetes is another big risk factor, and also high cholesterol is a risk factor. So these are your traditional risk factors. These are the things, generally, if you go to your regular physician visits, this is what you're screened for. But what we've actually, and high blood pressure, sorry. But what we've actually come to find out is that um, there's different risk factors for women. And there's also things we call modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. So non-modifiable risk factors are things like age and family history. We're gonna get older as long as we keep getting uh, more days on this world, so that's great. Um, but it does increase your risk in postmenopausal women are exceptional uh, risk for cardiovascular disease. And if you have a first degree relative who's less than 55 as a man or less than 65 as a female and has cardiovascular disease, that increases your risk. So not much you can do about those. But risk factors that um, are modifiable and can pose a greater risk in women versus men are things like smoking, a low HDL, which is the good cholesterol, diabetes, and obesity. So we know that if a man and a woman of the same age have these risk factors, a woman's more likely to die of cardiovascular disease or have a cardiovascular event if they have these problems. Uh, so it's important to just make sure that we're giving that information to people for the things that we can actually change. 
the important thing to recognize that the benefits for the therapy are the same. So we know that women actually get prescribed medications to help with these conditions less often than men. Women often leave hospital with less prescriptions than men do if they've come in with a cardiovascular event and we're really doing a disservice there from a health perspective because we know that the benefits are the same for both men and women for those therapies. Female specific risk factors is something that's really come to be a more hot topic in the last couple of years. And this is something that even in medical school, uh, I wasn't taught that there were female specific risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Um, but what we've really come to understand is that pregnancy is nature's stress test for the heart. So this is a huge uh, physiologic load that women undergo in their younger years and it can be a, a kind of a key event, it can herald events that are going to happen in the future. So things that we pay attention to are things like high blood pressure or a condition called preeclampsia. Uh, if you have gestational diabetes, you're 20 times more likely to develop diabetes after your pregnancy. Uh, if you have a preterm infant before the age of 37 weeks, that increases your risk of cardiovascular disease. And they think it might have something to do with the fact that you just have vascular insufficiency and the placenta actually doesn't grow enough to support uh, a baby to full term. Um, Another thing, someone mentioned obesity. And we know that if women don't get back to their pre-pregnancy weight within 12 months postpartum, that this may actually also raise your risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, so it's important to make sure that we are talking about these things with women, that we're looking into ways to try to prevent some of these events during pregnancy, and that we're using these things as heralds so that we can pay attention to uh, women that have these conditions and follow them up more closely, maybe be more aggressive in terms of risk factor modification for them because their risk is higher. Um, other unique risk factors for women include menopause as well. We talked about the two to three higher risk in postmenopausal. And there's a condition called PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, and oftentimes those women can't get pregnant, so they may not have some of these other uh, symptoms that we can see. Um, but those women are also at higher risk um, because there's a lot of androgens that circulate in their system like testosterone. So their physiologic system might be more comparable to uh, a man's. Oops. Um, so we talked a little bit about risk factors are different versus women and men. So some people might question, are symptoms different? And I know there's a lot of things in the literature, you hear it a little bit more on the radio, um, about heart attacks are different for men and women. And I actually really dislike that construct. So I'm gonna pick on the Oklahoma Heart Institute. But signs like this, I think, are really doing a disservice where they separate men and women into separate piles and say, you're gonna have these symptoms and you're gonna have these symptoms. Because the reality is less than 50% of people that present with a cardiovascular event present with chest pain whether you're a man or a woman, that's the reality. So I think the important thing is to be more aware of what the symptoms are, rather than thinking about people being in two different camps, because I can tell you from my experience as a cardiologist, there's a lot of overlap. And I think it's more about being aware and recognizing the symptoms than saying your symptoms are gonna be different than your symptoms are. Um, so people are most likely to recognize that Hollywood heart attack, that clutching, chest pain, uh, that's what people think about as heart disease and what I think we need to do is change that a little bit. Um, signs such as nausea, sudden fatigue or shortness of breath are often reported by women and they are more often reported by women um, but they are also reported by men um, and so they think that maybe it's not necessarily that people have different symptoms, but that women tend to report more symptoms when they come in with events, and that can change the perspective about how people interpret where their symptoms are coming from. So if a man comes in and says, I have chest pain, and a woman comes in and says, I have chest pain and shortness of breath, and I feel very tired, they may, the physician might interpret that differently and go down a completely different path, and that can lead to problems going forward. So early heart attack signs were missed in 78% of women. This was the report from the Heart and Stroke, give this information. 
Now what they left out in this pictorial, but what they put in the fine print was that 78% of early heart attack signs were missed or dismissed by women. So women themselves were dismissing some of these symptoms and not actually coming to care. Um, and I think that's important to think about when we're talking about education and how we can change things going forward. Certainly it has to be education for healthcare providers, but also education for the public. So this is a, a neat website called CardioSmart where they make these really nice pictures that help to give us uh, a little bit more information. So heart attack symptoms can include things like arm, neck, jaw pain or back pain, chest pain or discomfort, shortness of breath, nausea or vomiting, dizziness or lightheadedness, and other symptoms like cold sweats, unusual tiredness, and restlessness or trouble sleeping. So all of these things can be signs and symptoms of a heart attack. So it's important to, if you have any of these symptoms out of the ordinary, that we, you go and seek medical attention. And you guys know about this stuff a lot more than the general public will. Um, so it's part of our responsibility to help teach you guys, but for also for you guys to take some of the information and disseminate it to your family and friends. And it's important that way that we try to spread the message. So women are at risk. Um, so we saw that the results of those uh, that survey in 2013 also showed there's high rates of overweight or obesity, high stress levels, unhealthy food, and poor exercise habits. But again, only 20% of people said their physicians talk to them regularly about heart health. So we're kind of missing the boat in terms of trying to do prevention for these women. And I think that this is a really important point because I can tell you, I haven't been, I've been out of medical school for a number of years, but not that long. Um, and I can tell you this is not something that was even brought up or talked about at all. So it is in the responsibility of us as educators of medical students to make sure that they understand that we do need to address these things with women. There was a study published, uh, and this kind of emphasizes my point, but only 22% of primary care physicians and 42% of cardiologists felt well prepared to assess heart disease in women. So it's a really low percentage. This was an, an American study, so hopefully we're doing a little bit better, but I would suspect that we're probably around the same. And, hope, and we hope that this is getting better, and there are some um, developments in medical school curriculum where sex and gender are starting to be uh, addressed so that we're not leaving these black holes where we're um, missing and mistreating patients. When it comes to actual having events, women are more likely to delay care in getting to the emergency room, which we discussed. Women are less likely to get fast and aggressive treatment in the eMERGE, so only about 29% of women that came in with heart attack symptoms got their ECG within the first 10 minutes, which is your standard of care. Uh, women are less likely to be discharged on recommended medications. Um, sometimes this is a physiologic issue. Women tend to have lower blood pressures, so adding in some of the cardiac medications can be challenging. But the fact is that doctors aren't great about adding on new medications and seeing people quickly after they're discharged from hospital. Our healthcare system doesn't support us well in doing that. So this is a problem because our point of care when we have a chance to see patients and get them on the right medications is generally that initial hospital visit. Women are also at greater risk of drug-induced heart rhythm disorders than men. Women have more adverse drug reactions and they're twice as likely to have bleeding complications from angioplasty. Uh, so it's important that we pay attention to these things and we need to try to figure out ways that we can actually reduce these risks, not just respond to them. Uh, women who had a heart attack are 30% more likely to die than men. And women who have a stroke are 45% more likely to die than men. So this is likely a combination of factors later presentation, not getting aggressive treatment, not getting the preventative medications, and maybe not getting the message out there that it's a problem that you have to pay attention to early on, but also it's a healthcare, it's a physician recognition problem, uh, and that's why we really need this three-pronged approach to try to reform things so we can do better by women in, our, in Canada. There's an inherent bias in research, and this is a problem going back a number of years. So women were initially excluded from all landmark cardiovascular trials. So about two-thirds of cardiovascular research focuses on men. This sounds very sinister, like women were excluded because they didn't want to have them in their studies. But really, this all came out of the thalidomide issue in the 60s. Um, 
they tried, they had women in the studies and what happened was birth defects where they had uh, limb uh, agenesis and malformation. So after that happened, it was a huge North American issue. And after that happened, they really wanted to keep women who could possibly be pregnant away from drugs that they didn't know were safe. So it was not done from a place of uh, maliciousness, it was done from a place of safety. But really what happens now is it calls into question whether or not we can really use those cardiovascular trials to effectively care for women because we don't have them represented in the populations. And it wasn't actually until 1997 that Health Canada mandated equal representation of men and women in research studies. So that was only a couple of decades ago. And studies take decades to produce, so you can imagine how far behind we are in that equal representation. So I think what we can see from this is that women's cardiovascular disease is very complicated. There's a lot of moving pieces and we're just starting to get an image of kind of what it looks like in our society. Um, the good news is changes are coming. So there's awareness campaigns uh, such as you guys all um, have our buttons available for us, Her Heart Matters. So there's the red dress campaign that was done by the American um, College of Cardiology or the American Heart Association. The heart and stroke is Her Heart Matters. So there's education campaigns out there to empower women and that's part of the reason why we're here tonight. Um, like I mentioned, curriculums in medical schools are being developed to address this bias and to try to eliminate it from, um, from being there. And that multiple funding organizations that fund big research like the CIHR um, are demanding an explanation regarding sex and gender considerations for all new research proposals. So the mandate is that you have equal representation and if you're not going to have equal representation you have to explain why. And if uh, you have to explain, there's a paragraph on each grant proposal that says how you're taking sex and gender into consideration when you're doing your research study. So at least it's coming out there in the research world so that we can start to think about how it's affecting our results. There's also a lot of ongoing and new research in pregnancy complications and vascular disease, which is this relatively new entity, um, and cardiovascular disease that tends to affect women more often. So there's certain things that tend to affect women's hearts because women tend to have smaller overall vessels, they tend to have less obstructive or blockages that completely block arteries, and they tend to have these other um, these other conditions like spontaneous coronary artery dissection, microvascular coronary disease, uh, and heart disease associated with rheumatic disease. Those are all more common in women, and we're just really starting to understand how those all interplay. All right, so I'm gonna turn um, my, the presentation over to Laura. All right, good evening. Uh, so I'll do the second half of the presentation this evening. I will focus more on the cardiac rehab uh, perspectives and how women and men have um, historically been enrolled in cardiac rehab but we do see some differences with men being more likely to be referred and complete uh, cardiac rehab programs relative to women. So there's still work that's ongoing and that we're trying to work towards uh, so that both men and women can benefit uh, equally. And many of you in this room are obviously experts in this area of cardiac rehab com coming through the program. Uh, some of the benefits that can be derived from coming to an outpatient cardiac rehab program like uh, the one we have here are, are obviously a, a reduction in cardiac events uh, and, and perhaps the severity of those cardiac events. So being less likely to uh, pass away uh, after having uh, a second cardiac event uh, if you've been doing your, your homework and you've been getting out there and exercising and, uh, and uh, living a healthy lifestyle uh, with, with diet and exercise and that kind of thing. Um, so improved survival rates, in, improved functional status. So just being able to do those activities of, of uh, uh, those everyday activities like going to the grocery store, uh, going for walks, um, engaging in uh, physical activities like golf and skiing and, and, th and those kinds of things, as well as uh, improved uh, psychosocial well-being. So uh, in terms of uh, overall mood uh, and, uh, and rates of depression. Following a cardiac event, 
Uh, many of you will have had a personal experience with being referred to a cardiac rehab program. For some of you, that was probably relatively simple and straightforward. Some of you have, may have encountered uh, barriers along the way. Um, you may have uh, spoken to a healthcare provider in hospital who referred you for a cardiac rehab program, uh, or you may have been referred by um, a, a family doctor to come into the program as well. Um, but that is not, uh, that is, there, there are huge inconsistencies. In, in the system and that's not an automatic process uh, to date. So um, not everybody uh, has access to a cardiac rehab program and not everybody is referred uh, to a cardiac rehab program. So um, the referral rates uh, tend to be around uh, uh, one third of patients actually being referred uh, to, a, to an outpatient type program uh, and you'll see that not everybody who's actually referred will actually show up and attend uh, and complete the cardiac rehab program. So uh, about one fifth of patients who have a cardiac event may actually uh, enroll in an actual outpatient cardiac rehab program. Now, given that the theme of, uh, of February uh, is surrounding women and heart health, uh, one of the questions that comes to mind is who is more likely to take part in cardiac rehab? Is it that men and women both equally take part in it? Is, that, is it that more men take part in it or is that more women take part in it? How many people think more men take part in cardiac rehab? That may come from personal experience and what you've witnessed in your, in your cardiac rehab classes as well. Um, but uh, there, that it, it is in fact true that there are more men who, uh, who will take part in and complete cardiac rehab. And so just a bit of background to explain why we see some of these differences. So we, we obviously know from the first part of uh, the lecture this evening uh, that women uh, have a significant risk for cardiac disease and, and can benefit to the same extent uh, if given particular therapies and if they, they attend an outpatient type um, rehabilitation program. However, there are a number of reasons why women may have less access to attend cardiac rehab programs. You can see here that there are uh, stark differences or significant contrasts in the enrollment rates of, among men and women. And so the idea is that historically, uh, in, in years past, women have fallen behind when it comes to cardiac care and cardiac rehabilitation. Um, so there are barriers to adherence such as finding exercise particularly painful or tiring. Historically, women have had more responsibilities in terms of caregiving type responsibilities, whether it be for children or, or taking care of elderly parents. Lack of transportation, so sometimes it's not always easy to get to a center like uh, this, which can uh, disproportionately affect women. As well as uh, as well as uh, other um, as well as other uh, chronic conditions uh, and things like uh, musculoskeletal disorders uh, or other chronic health conditions that may affect women and, and in part women tend to be older when they're re referred and participate in cardiac rehab so they may be uh, presenting with some of these other health conditions that say the younger male who gets referred to cardiac rehab may not be as susceptible to. Now if we look at uh, graduates from the program I may have accidentally given this question away, um, but who is more likely to actually graduate from a cardiac rehab program? Once again, do we see similar rates among men and women? Do men and women both uh, graduate from cardiac rehab to the same extent? Or is it uh, men that graduate more or women that graduate more? Show of hands for women. Anyone women? And men? Yes. Yes, in fact, it's men that, once again, are more likely to graduate from a cardiac rehab program. 
This is a nice uh, diagram once again showing you all the benefits of cardiac rehab. So once again, things like lowering your overall risk of having another heart attack or dying from another cardiac event, as well as modifying some of the risk factors that Ashley spoke about early, earlier. Just as Ashley had alluded to, there are awarenesses, uh, awareness uh, campaigns and, and changes that have been coming through the Heart and Stroke Foundation uh, and to look at women and how they are often misunderstood uh, in terms of their risk factors, but also in terms of their actual care and, and therapies. From a research perspective, uh, it is definitely uh, something that, uh, as researchers, we are um, becoming more aware of. And we, uh, as Ashley had mentioned, we are uh, we are now required when we submit research grants and uh, to get funding from the government, we do have to um, include explanations and include reasons for why um, and why it is important to study both men and women, and if you are not studying women for an exam for a particular reason you have to provide some sort of uh, rationale or discussion around why women wouldn't be included in your study so the, the emphasis has changed and and hopefully the research and the guidelines that surround cardiac care for women will change uh, with these uh, changes uh, coming from the government As you know, graduating from a cardiac rehab program, it's important to stay active far beyond your six month uh, cardiac rehab program. Uh, there are a number of exercise facilities. Um, uh, I, either you participate in a graduate type program here or in the community that offers exercise uh, programming, uh, whether, uh, whether it be in the community center or mall walking, or um, you can do so on your, uh, on your own at home. And while here during the rehabilitation process we focus largely on activities like walking and uh, using exercise bikes and, and, and things like that, uh, it's also important to remember that exercise can be accumulated or can be uh, done in small um, short bouts. Uh, and it can include many different types of activities within your, within your physical capacity. So it could include things like dancing, gardening, walking. Uh, it's not just the walking prescription. Uh, trying to get out there and be as active as you can will, uh, uh, within your limits can be beneficial. This is a final poll question, but graduating from cardiac rehab uh, concludes or, or actually stops your access to the Toronto Rehab Resources. And I'll just say that that is not true. Uh, there are many opportunities to still um, participate uh, in, in, the car, uh, in the, some of the program that we offer. Uh, if one of the big things it, that we offer is the Cardiac College website. And if you have access to a computer, uh, this is a great resource. So it's, there's a cardiaccollege.ca website and then there's a diabetes college website. Uh, and both of them have great resources on the website uh, regarding um, cardiac rehabilitation related um, uh, questions that you may have around uh, getting active, staying active, uh, ex um, examples around exercising in cold weather or hot weather, and, and some of the things that you should take into consideration when you're exercising. There's also great resources around, um, around uh, maintaining a healthy diet, and there's video links uh, on there as well. There are also on the Cardiac College website uh, uh, links uh, to refresh yourself on some of the strength training um, programs that you would have completed while you were in the program. So if you can't remember how to do a certain exercise, there are videos uh, that provide um, guidance on proper technique for, for doing uh, those weight-based exercises that you would have done while attending uh, the cardiac rehab program. There's obviously also the graduate classes and any sort of follow-up exercise tests that you may, um, that you may subscribe to or, or want to do, um, say, a year after you've finished your cardiac rehab program. That concludes the presentation, the formal part of the presentation for this evening. Uh, at this time, uh, both of us will take
questions uh, from the audience. Um, you mentioned menopause, and uh, I'm just wondering how uh, you recommend uh, hormone replacement therapy with menopause, because I've heard uh, it can be detrimental to that. Yeah, so it's, it's an interesting question, and initially, it was thought to be simple that female hormones and estrogen was protective, and so if someone's postmenopausal, then the thought was give them estrogen and that will remain protective. But what they actually found in the women's heart or the women's health study is that it actually increased uh, risk of dying. So at this point, hormone replacement therapy is not recommended. Um, it's actually recommended against taking high dose uh, hormone replacement therapy, especially if you've had previous um, cardiovascular issues. Um, it's a challenge though, because obviously the symptoms of menopause can be very distressing and it can make people feel very unwell, which can lead them to deteriorate in all other sort of their lifestyle protective things that they're doing. So. Um, I'm not a family doctor, so I don't deal with it as much from that perspective, but some of my good friends are, and it's, it's a balancing act. It's always about choosing what's going to be the best option for you and weighing the risks and the benefits in your particular case. But as a blanket statement, hormone replacement therapy is thought to actually increase uh, your risk of cardiovascular events. Hmm. So herbal things are tricky. Um, we don't learn about herbal remedies. So physicians that are trained in kind of your typical medical schools, we don't get teaching about that. Um, the problem with a lot of herbal remedies is that they're not regulated. So it's very difficult for us to know what's in those products and that can make it very difficult to know how it's going to interact with your other medications. Um, a lot of them aren't regulated so that can be really tricky. Um, sometimes working in conjunction with, with a naturopathic doctor because some of their medications are more regulated and have been more tested uh, can be a good thing but it is challenging to find that kind of connection where you can have I think a, a combination of both practitioners working working together um, and to be honest they just don't have the research to support those kind of remedies. Yeah, so I think it comes back to the fact they mentioned 78% of women missed the early, or 78% of the early signs of heart attack are missed in women. So I think it stems from that. So like I had mentioned, sometimes women come in reporting different symptoms. It can lead them down a different diagnostic path. So actually what you're getting is you're not getting the fast aggressive treatment for cardiovascular problems because that's not what is being thought of as the first diagnosis. So it's not necessarily about gender discrimination that they're not helping a woman who they think is having that Hollywood heart attack. It's more of people are just missing the early signs because of the way that they're represented aren't necessarily typical for what they're expecting. I think we had one down here first, yeah. The second last slide there suggested you should book your annual exercise test. Um, are you saying you book it here at Toronto? So there is the opportunity, uh, say a year following uh, your graduation from the program, to do a follow-up exercise test. It's not mandatory, and sometimes if you're followed by a cardiologist at certain intervals, they would also do a, some sort of stress test outside of this clinic. So you could do it outside of outside of here in consultation with your... Every year, you just do it once, one year after you go to the program. You could. It could. You could do it every year, though, if you so wish. Uh, or sometimes, I, 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 cardiologists outside of, of uh, this facility will do stress tests on a, a, a at a particular interval when they feel it's necessary or warranted. Yeah. So we we've got what's called the pulse check for people who have graduated from the program. If they continue to exercise on a regular basis, 
they can fill out this paperwork with their doctor. Basically, their doctor says, yeah, I've seen you. He's okay for a stress test. Bring the form into the center. We will set you up for one of our cardiopulmonary assessments. Keeping in mind the focus of our test is to assess your fitness. And then once you have that test, Di, who is actually checking everybody in, will give you a call and go over the results of the test with you, talk about your current activity exercise program, talk about heart rates, and then give you any feedback or modifications that you might have. You can do it on a yearly basis, and we've had some people that have been having tests, grad tests die five, six, seven years in a row, if not longer. Back to 2009. Back to 2009, <laughs> so some have gone for nine years in a row. You do need to be exercising on a regular basis, though. Okay. Yeah, and, and be feeling well. I'm just referring back to the previous question. Um, it's, it's reassuring to hear that the medical schools are updating their education to uh, uh, medical students with regards to what we presented here. Um, my question is, is what mechanism is in place to uh, educate the thousands of family doctors that Yeah, so it, it's a challenge because there aren't widespread education. Now, as part of our medical degrees, we do need to maintain a certain level of competency. Um, so there's something called CME, or Continuing Medical Education, and there's actually a certain level that every physician has to complete every year to try to stay up to date. Um, so different modules are released by different organizations, um, but it really needs to be a self kind of addressed um, initiative in order to pick up particular areas. So certainly um, we hope by doing some of these education uh, sessions more people will ask questions which will lead more physicians to ask questions and regularly when studies are done which find deficits um, especially organizations like American Heart Association and uh, Heart and Stroke try to release education to try to um, update education. So the Heart and Stroke reports are certainly things that are released every year. There was one last year that's focused on uh, it's called Misunderstood, um, and it's focused on women in cardiovascular, uh, in protective cardiovascular care, sorry, in particular. And the one this year is um, more focused on brain and heart health and the connection between that and also um, dementia and uh, memory and things like that. But there's no widespread initiative across the province or across Canada or across the US that I'm aware of in terms of reaching out to existing practitioners. So, Although I would guess there's a, a, a professional expectation that peer reviewed journals are being submitted. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think the, the big thing is the, the most physicians try to stay up to date by doing these CME activities, by staying abreast of the current issues. This is a hot topic in research, especially in younger women. And I think just having that uh, sex and gender information coming out more in research and being highlighted more in research, it'll become more of an issue. Um, but certainly it's a challenge. So asking your physician about your own health as a woman can certainly spur them to start looking into those things a little bit more closely and understanding that a little bit better so like I mentioned it, it's a responsibility kind of of the public of the healthcare system and of physicians themselves to kind of take it upon themselves to understand and recognize the bias um, so far we haven't been doing a great job of it so hopefully we can uh, improve as, as time goes on I was just going to add to that. So she mentioned the the Heart and Stroke Report. It's actually a fairly reader-friendly magazine type report that they put out in 2018, misunderstood. Uh, and you can actually look at that. It's freely available online on the Heart and Stroke website. It has lots of these statistics, but it is fairly reader-friendly. It's not like a journal publication where you see tons of text. Um, so that is something that if you really liked tonight's lecture on women and, and heart health, that uh, is, is kind of like a further reading if you're really interested in the topic. Yes? So I, I have four questions. <laughs> um, in the section under female risk factors, one of the things you talked about was smoking. Obviously that's a risk factor for everyone, but is it higher in women because more women smoke? 
No, so those specific risk factors, we're talking more, so if a woman smokes, that puts them at a higher risk than at the same age of a man that smokes. So it's not that more women smoke, it's just that if a woman smokes, it means worse prognosis for them than if a man's smoking. So it's the same with the cholesterol. If a woman has lower good cholesterol, a man with that same level of cholesterol will be at lower risk of developing cardiovascular events. So it's not necessarily to do with how much of how many women are smoking, it's more to do with if you smoke as a woman, you're putting yourself at a higher risk than, say, a man that's smoking the same amount. Why? We don't know. So... You, you partly answered my second question. Mm -hmm. uh, in the HDL number for females, I believe the target in a high-risk patient is 1.3 millivolts per mm -hmm. year. And a, for a man, I think it's 1.1. Yeah, or 1. one. Why hire for a woman? Well, it all feeds back to the fact that we know that when we looked back in retrospective data or prospective studies, when we see that a woman has a higher rate of LDL, it offers her the same protection as a man that has a rate of 1.1 versus 1.3. So we don't understand completely why men and women have differences. We know a lot of it has to do with hormones and uh, physiologic differences just Men, like I mentioned, have bigger hearts, they have bigger arteries, um, they tend to form more obstructive disease, so laying down plaque in an, uh, a coronary vessel of a man happens in a different way than it does in a woman. And those are things we just kind of are brushing the surface of at this point. We don't really understand all of that because, as you saw, we talked about research wasn't really being done in women, so we weren't really understanding those differences in the beginning. So in the emergency ward, typically, if a man presents with symptoms of a potential heart attack, they do that blood test to find the marker. Why would they not do that routinely for women as well? Because you can eliminate, and I think you can eliminate the fact that a heart attack is occurring if, if that marker is absent in the blood. So it's a bit more complicated than that, but I think that the the real issue is just the recognition. So it's the recognition that certain symptoms can represent a heart attack and certain symptoms might not. So it's not that people are automatically saying, oh, a woman with chest pain doesn't have heart disease, I'm not going to look for heart problems when I do initial investigations. It's just that people might present differently. So nausea and vomiting might come in with a woman. The first instinct might to be to look for gastrointestinal problems not heart problems so they may not have that marker done right away and that's how it could be missed um, so I, I that statistic is a bit misleading but it's not the fact that um, women are coming into emergent just being ignored or not being treated it's just the symptoms that they have can sometimes lead people down different diagnostic pathways and that doesn't always include the same uh, cardiovascular risk it wasn't if I if you had a woman coming into the emergency room in their 40s women are less likely to have cardiovascular disease at that age than a man is so it might be and we're taught that and that's the reality so it's possible that heart disease wouldn't be the first thing that would come into my mind you might start to look for alternate issues the reality is those demographics are changing a little bit historically that was true but now we're coming to see that women are having heart disease younger and maybe we need to start thinking a little bit more about heart disease in people where before we may not have so it's a bit of a shifting perspective because of the population the way that things are changing then last question real quick. Mm -hmm. This one's for Rob. Uh oh. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you, you guys mentioned that thirty four percent of uh, cardiac patients are referred to a rehab program. Twenty percent actually enroll. So my question is what percent actually graduate? Do you know the stats? I think our stats are around 65, 70% of our patients yeah. complete. Yeah, it's usually around 70%. Yeah. So, so the 20 goes down to about 12%. Yeah. 12 people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. One, yeah. So one, 1 in 10 people that should be going through rehab are actually graduating. That's right. Yeah. And there's a lot of issues around how 
that happens and there have been great strides in trying to make automatic referrals out of the cardiovascular program so um, I know here in Toronto and in London they if you come into um, one of the heart wards either in CCU or on the ward you're automatically referred to cardiac rehab um, but part of our problem in Canada is what determines you going to cardiac rehab and completing cardiac rehab has nothing to do with anything except for ge geography so if you're the biggest determinant, it's not nothing to do with, there's, but the biggest determinant of whether or not people will attend cardiac rehab and finish is geographic location. Uh, so the, pr the province, just on Ontario, is actually underserviced by cardiac rehab and there's about 200,000 spots per year that should exist to serve the current patient populations that don't exist. Uh, and part of that's linked to funding. So most of cardiac rehab is not funded to the extent that it needs to be through, um, through government funding. So oftentimes it has to be private uh, funds that help to make up the difference. Uh, and, it, and people are actually paying. Uh, one of our researchers, uh, Dr. Sherry Grace, um, did a research and actually, or did a study and actually found that people are paying out of pocket up to $130 for something that's supposed to be funded by the government and it varies widely through Canada. Um, so nationally, there's actually those 200,000 spots, so not Ontario, sorry, but nationally, those 200,000 spots that are just not available for patients to access. Um, so even if we had all those referrals come in, it would be wonderful, but we wouldn't be able to service all the patients and the numbers of cardiovascular um, patients are really increasing as, as people live longer with good cardiovascular care when they're younger. So. Um, it really does is going to take a paradigm shift in the next 20 years or so to try to be able to uh, accommodate people and try to increase the capacity for cardiac rehab. And even within, I should say, even within uh, the greater Toronto area, um, the cardiac rehab programs that are offered vary significantly. So we are fortunate here to have what is currently a six month program uh, and it involves weekly exercise classes. Not every cardiac rehab program has the facilities that we have here with a track and exercise tests that help to guide the type of exercise that you do and that's safe for you. So not every cardiac rehab program even within a fairly small radius in Toronto is the same. Three questions. <laughs> So we definitely know there's certain diagnostic tests that are common that can be less sensitive in women. So there's a gradient of testing. Uh, the least invasive is the least sensitive. So our exercise stress test that you do just on a treadmill without the mouthpiece is only about 60% sensitive in detecting obstructive coronary disease. And just because you have obstructive coronary disease, or just because you don't have obstructive coronary disease, doesn't mean you don't have non-obstructive coronary disease, which is actually more likely sometimes to rupture and cause a heart attack. Uh, and we know that in women, in particular, exercise stress tests are less sensitive in women than in men um, because of breast tissue and, and physiology. That's just the reality. So there certainly are differences in diagnostic testing between men and women. Sometimes even angiograms, there's certain testing that's starting to become more common and looking at things like coronary blood flow. Um, so not just looking, because an angiogram itself, we put dye into the arteries and you're just looking basically at a picture of what the inside of the lumen looks like. But it's a 2D picture of a 3D structure. 
Um, so there are more advanced uh, testing we can do looking at blood flow between certain areas and looking at ultrasound and other um, methodologies to better image the vessels. Uh, but the problem is that with a lot of these um, technologies, they're very, very expensive. Um, so in a public health care system, we've, there's limitations from that perspective. Um, but also, they're, they're, we don't have widespread information on always how to use those results and how to apply them to a population basis. So there's always evolving um, diagnostic testing studies that have, are being done. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the new methodologies are uh, very expensive because that's who developing new products is how companies fund these studies and why they're why they're looking at it. It's hard to say you're going to take a study of an existing um, methodology, so say like a nuclear stress test, and go back and, and um, test it on a whole different population than the initial tests were done on um, because no one's going to pay for that study. So it is an issue of trying to find funding to try to look at some of these um, these diagnostic tests and differences in men and women, but we do know differences exist. Um, and I'm, suspicion and different types of disease, like I mentioned, women can have more kind of microvascular disease, so you can be very symptomatic from that, but most of our diagnostic tests won't find any sort of evidence of cardiovascular disease. So I think it's a bit of understanding our tests, a bit of looking at new uh, methodologies to try to figure out how we can best serve our patients, and also thinking about these other conditions that can uh, contribute to disease that maybe we haven't defined as well and keeping those on your radar. Um, so it's a tricky question to answer. I don't know of any um, studies in particular that are looking at diagnostics and looking at the gender bias uh, or the sex difference between the two, um, but I've never actually looked that up, so it's very possible that there's some going on. where they, they have you know, a, a pretty strong suspicion that something's wrong. They've gone through you know the basic tests and the more and the more invasive tests. Yeah. And things are still showing up negative. Doctors start to kind of dismiss your complaints. Yeah. Uh, so it, it no, absolutely. And being an advocate for yourself and continually presenting, saying something's not right, that just is unfortunately the way that you have to, things have to go. So there, there's actually a story of a similar situation for a woman um, regarding heart attack and stroke in the most recent heart and stroke report. Um, and she said the same thing, it's important to just be an advocate for yourself. And if something's not right and you're not feeling it's right, don't accept um, the results of a test being negative and, sh and it's difficult. I, I understand navigating the healthcare system is difficult for people that are inside the healthcare system or understand it versus be the public. It's very challenging. Um, but I think just trying to keep in mind if something doesn't feel right, to keep searching for answers and keep looking. And um, unfortunately, we're not, uh, we can't predict the future. And our tests do have false negatives and false positives. Um, so we're not always going to make the right decisions uh, and I think gathering second opinions and just being aware that there's going to be test error and human error and everyone most situations is trying to do the best that they can for you but if you're not happy with the with the diagnosis you're given or the the care that you're getting to just keep um, representing. Banks, Dr. Heidemann, thank you very much. Wonderful session.